spend about 50 minutes looking at 1 John. This is was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you so that our joy may be complete. Let's ask God for help. Lord God Almighty, we come before you this morning and Lord, in the midst of the blistery cold air outside we pray that you would warm our hearts with the truth of your word that you would give us a deeper understanding a fuller richer understanding of who the Lord Jesus is and that we would respond with a heart of faith a confidence and assurance as to who this person Jesus is and that we would live our lives in light of who he is Lord I pray for those who have no saving knowledge of Jesus this morning, no acquaintance with him, we pray that you would work through your word to draw them to the Savior even this morning. In whose name we pray, amen. It was at Caesarea Philippi that Jesus asked that famous question to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And if you remember, in that instance, the disciples there, there was several different responses. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're like Jeremiah. And then Jesus asked that very pointed question. And in my imagination, I imagine Jesus pointing his finger at them. I don't know if he actually did that. He says, yes, but who, what, do you say that I am? And you remember it was the Apostle Peter who, when he spoke up, it didn't always come out well. But in this instance, it came out wonderfully well. Uh, He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you remember Jesus said, uh, just remember, Peter, that you didn't say this on your own. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but God has revealed this to you through special revelation. Well, there's a very real sense in which we could ask that same question today. Who do men say that Jesus is? And then ask that question more pointedly, who do you say that Jesus is? It's really a question in which your eternity hangs upon. Because if you don't get the answer right to that question, then you don't believe in the right Jesus. And according to Jesus' own words, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And so eternity really hangs in the balance as to how you answer that question. In the context in which the Apostle John is writing to the church that he's writing to is one in which there was confusion on that question. Or confusion not on the question, but the answer to that question. Because there was a group who had arose from within the church perhaps even ascended to leadership positions within that church and were teaching in teaching positions who were saying things like Jesus did not have a real physical body. Because you see, matter, the physical, that which you can feel, touch, handle, taste, and smell is evil. It's been tainted by sin, but it's the spiritual that is good. And so, therefore, there's no conceivable way that the Lord Jesus could have had a real physical body. It just appeared like he had a physical body. And these early church 
uh, what were labeled as heretics, uh, they were called docetists from the Greek word dikeo, which means to think or to appear. They would say that Jesus just appeared to have a human body. And so right out of the gate, the Apostle John wants us to be clear and certain as to who Jesus is. And so that's how he starts his letter. He doesn't, he doesn't even formally introduce himself as John the Apostle. He doesn't say to whom he's writing. Immediately he takes those to whom he's writing by the hand and says, I want you to see something. I want you to see what I saw some 50 years prior. John is writing as an old man. Some 50 years prior, he was an eyewitness. And so this morning, we're going to give you two historical realities concerning Jesus, two historical witnesses that John gives us so that you would have confidence in who Jesus is. First is the historical witness to the humanity of Jesus. Notice how John starts this little letter to the church. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It's an interesting way. The, the first four verses is really one sentence, and this is one of those sentences that if you've ever diagrammed sentences or if you're into grammar, this is a grammatical nightmare. You know, He starts with indirect objects. It ends with verbs and subjects, and it, it's a real uh, kind of challenging sentence to parse out. But notice he starts this way. He starts, what was from the beginning? Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're familiar especially with John's other writings, you'll know that this is a very, very familiar way to start out a book with the word beginning. Well, you say it might, that might sound normal. You, every book starts with a beginning. But no, the actual word beginning, right? The Gospel of John starts, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we might be tempted to import that beginning into this beginning in the letter of 1 John, but I would suggest to you it's another beginning. The beginning in the Gospel of John that starts out, in the beginning was the Word, takes us back to the beginning of creation and says, in the beginning, is almost like, you remember those, uh, those things called VCRs? Almost like a cassette tape. If you rewound history back like it was a vcr all the way back to the beginning and you turn around and look into eternity in the beginning was the word and the word was there with god that's the the beginning of the gospel of john but here in the epistle of john the letter of john he says what was from the beginning is a different beginning because, John, we have to give any author the liberty to use beginning in different ways. There's different beginnings. And the beginning he's referring to here, I think, is referring back to either the beginning of the ministry of Jesus or maybe even to the beginning of the first time that those who heard the message of the apostles when they first believed. Their first experience with Christian truth, he's going back to what they believed at the beginning. Uh, there's a couple different ways. Listen to how John uses beginning in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 64. He says, There are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they, who they were who did not believe and who it was who be, would betray, betray him. And so Jesus here, as he has the disciples before them, it, it, John records that Jesus knew from the beginning who was a believer and who was not a believer, that Judas, one of them, would betray him. So clearly the beginning John uses here is from the beginning of Jesus' ministry here. In the letter of John... In chapter 2, in verse 24, 1 John 2, 24, says, As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. 
If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. He's, so John's saying, go back to what you first heard at the beginning. When, I, when, when the message of the gospel was first preached to you, go back to the beginning and hold on to that truth. Similarly, uh, in 1 John 3.11, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And you say, well, this is, is an interesting way for John to start out this letter. That which was from the beginning. But you have to understand, the Apostle, Paul is, or Apostle John is dealing with people who were departing from the truth. And he's saying, go back to that which was first preached to you. Don't, don't believe these new ideas about Jesus that are being introduced. Go back to what you first heard. That's what's true. It's similar to what a friend of Charles Haddon Spurgeon said during the downgrade controversy when many of the churches in Europe were abandoning the authority of scriptures. He said, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it ain't new. In general, when it comes to theological truth, revealed truth in the Scripture, if it's new, then it's not true. If there's some new idea, then more than likely it's not true. That we're, we're always trying to go back to the old ideas of the Scripture, what God originally said through the apostles as they wrote it down in the Scriptures. And this is something similar to what John is saying here, that which was from the beginning. Now also notice as you look at this passage, it says in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Notice the word what. What, 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 what? He doesn't say who, right? Which puzzles us because we would think he's talking about Jesus, that which we have heard, that which we have, you know, handled, which we have touched, which we have seen. And he is talking about Jesus, but he's talking, the reason I think he uses what now, now, some people take the what as referring to, he's not talking about Jesus, but the message about Jesus. But I think what John is saying here is the, the what is particularly the humanity of Jesus. He calls it what because it's not all of who Jesus is, but it's an aspect, a nature of Jesus, namely his humanity that is the what that is being described here because that is part of what is under debate here, whether Jesus had a real human body. Arthur W. Pink says, quote, that which going from the King James, or what in our translation, namely, our Lord's manhood was from the beginning of this Christian era, that which we have heard speaking personally and audibly to us and in power to our hearts, that which we have seen with our eyes in tangible form, furnishing conclusive evidences of the reality of his manhood. And so John here says what because he's speaking of Jesus' humanity. And so listen to what, what John tells us here. He says in verse 1, what was from the beginning what we have heard. Notice again also the we. The we, the plurality, doesn't say what I have heard, the we. Because I think he's speaking in consensus with the apostolic testimony, with the testimony of the apostles. He uses this we elsewhere throughout the book uh, in, a, in a way that speaks of his authority as an early church apostle. Uh, and we think of the, the apostles, you know, uh, Paul says, uh, that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. They were the early church leaders. He says, what we have heard. John's saying, we were there. We listened 
to the teachings of Jesus. We were there after he fed the 5,000 and gave that bread of life discourse in John chapter 6. We were there in John chapter 10 where Jesus spoke of himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. We were there in John chapter 13 through 17 in that upper room where Jesus gives this final discourse to his disciples. We were there. We heard him with our own ears what was coming from his lips with his real lips and his real tongue and his real vocal cords. It was not a mere voice from heaven but it was the voice of a real human being standing across from us. And then notice he also says in verse 1, what we have seen with our eyes. But then notice the next phrase, what we have looked at. What we have seen with our eyes and what we have looked at. Is John being redundant here? He's not because he's using two different words. He says what we have seen and what we have looked at. The, the seen word carries the idea more of a glance where looking at carries more the idea of staring at, looking intently. And so John is saying we saw him with our own very eyes and not just looked at him, but we studied him. And, and I mean, I could imagine them at various times studying Jesus, right? I mean, can you imagine that time in which Jesus and, and the disciples are on the boat on the Sea of Galilee? And all of a sudden, a huge storm comes upon the boat. And remember, these guys, at least some of them, are professional fishermen. So they have seen storms before. But evidently, this storm was so crazy and so radical that they're waking Jesus up in fear that they're going to die you know they didn't say well we got you know Jesus is just a rabbi you know we got this covered we're the experienced fishermen no Jesus don't you care about us we're gonna die here and you remember what Jesus did he you know he wipes the crust out of his eyes I imagine and he rebukes the winds and the waves, says, quiet! And the sea becomes like glass. And these disciples who are initially afraid of the storm, remember Mark records now, they're afraid of Jesus. And you can imagine, I mean, so they're there. They see all this. So initially, you know, they see Jesus sleeping. Then they see Jesus commanding the winds and the waves. I, I could imagine a, after witnessing something like that, being behind Jesus and poking him, <laughs> seeing, does, does my hand go right through him? You know, is, is he a real human? And so they, they look, they not only saw Jesus, but they looked at him. They gazed upon him. They studied him. They saw him create enough bread to feed 5,000 men and maybe upwards of 20,000 people. And yet, they saw him get hungry on different occasions and eat. They saw him, as I mentioned, just get tired and take a nap, a late afternoon nap in the boat. And yet the same person commands the winds and the waves. They saw Jesus' face glowing. At least John and two others saw his face glowing on the Mount of Transfiguration as he's having a huddle with Elijah and Moses. And they also saw the agony on his face, sweating, pouring out sweat in Gethsemane. They saw him in the triumph of the resurrection with his glorified body. 
but they also saw him dying on a Roman cross in agony and pain and suffering. They saw him. They saw him. There's that Negro spiritual that goes, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they hung him on the cross? Were you there when they rolled away that stone? And John could have said, yeah, I was there, me. I watched it. I saw it. I gazed upon it. Now, again, this is hugely important because these false teachers who were not apostles were saying things like Jesus didn't have a real human body. And John's saying, wait a second here. I was an eyewitness. I saw. I heard. But then notice also, one more in verse 1. Just in case they weren't convinced and thought Jesus was really a mirage and said, yeah, 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 but, 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 did you touch him? And John says, and touched with our hands. We touched him. And wouldn't you know, John records in, in the Gospel of John as he, as he uh, shyly uh, doesn't refer to himself by name, but as the, the disciple that Jesus loved, as he records that those last hours before Jesus' execution, as Jesus was teaching in the upper room, he records that he was laying on Jesus' chest. Laying on Jesus' chest. He touched him. Again, Arthur Pink says, there's no possibility of the apostles being misled by an optical illusion. Peter had felt the firm grasp of Christ's hands when he caught hold of him and delivered him from sinking in the sea. John himself had reclined upon his bosom. Thomas and his fellows had been invited by him after he came forth triumphantly from the tomb. It was something more substantial than an ecstatic vision which John was here relating. He was a witness. Eyewitness of Jesus in his earthly ministry, in his death, and even the resurrected Jesus. And he could say he had a real human body. And this, by the way, was hugely important in the early church. Hugely important, the reality of the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. In fact, do you remember how Luke starts out his second volume, the book of Acts? He says, as Jesus says to his apostles, he says what? You are my witnesses. Now, sometimes we kind of read into that, you know, well, yeah, aren't we all witnesses? Yes, we're all witnesses in a sense, but we're not that kind of witness. <laughs> we weren't there to touch. We weren't there to handle. We weren't there to see. We didn't actually hear Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, but they did. And that's why later on in chapter 1, the importance of the replacement for Judas having been one who was an eyewitness. The apostles had to have seen the Lord. They were to testify. So John's saying to his readers, you guys need to be certain about this. You're confused. There's these guys over here that, that maybe you trusted who, who are saying Jesus didn't have a real human body. But I'm telling you on the authority of my own eyewitness testimony that he had a real human body that to deny such 
is to speak lies and falsehood. And that's what he says later on in the book. These guys are liars. They're antichrists. He says later on, if you deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you are an antichrist. And he wants his readers to have certainty that they can bank their life upon. They're confused. Their faith is wobbling. I remember some years ago, a friend of mine who, uh, she, she, um, she was at the college that Jimmy Swaggart was the president of when that whole scandal came out about him frequenting prostitutes. And I remember her telling Bernie and I how her, her faith was shaken by it. She didn't know what to believe. There's a very real sense in which I, I think of the, those to whom John's writing to, their faith had been shaken because these trusted leaders were beginning to teach lies. And God in his mercy has the Apostle Paul, John, there to write to them and say in his elderly years and, 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 and to say to them, I was there. We were there, all the apostles. But I'm telling you, he had a real human body. You can trust in him. You can bank your life upon this. And, and John, John the apostle, he's a man for our times because we live in such a world of fuzziness and uncertainties. In fact, in our culture, it's supposed to be a badge of humility that you're uncertain about things. It's interesting, the Catholic cultural critic by the name of G.K. Chesterton, he wrote this in the 1940s. He saw this kind of current uh, of um, what we would now call postmodern uncertainty uh, on the horizon, listen to what he said in his book called Orthodoxy. This is 60 years ago. He says, but what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. He says, modesty has moved from the organ of ambition and modesty has settled on the organ of conviction where it was never meant to be. A man is meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of that uh, part of man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert, namely himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, namely truth. The truth is that there is a real humility typical of our time, but it so happens that it, pra it is practically a more poisoning humility than the wildest prostrations of the ascetic. We are on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. <laughs> you give it? We are, re he says, we... <laughs> He says, we are producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. We don't even believe two plus two equals four anymore. Because we've put, in, we've put the virtue of humility on truth when it's supposed to be on ourselves. We're supposed to be doubtful about ourselves. We're supposed to suspect ourselves, but today we're confident about ourselves. Instead of being confident about the truth and doubtful about ourselves. 60 years ago he wrote that. How very perceptive. And so John speaks to us in a culture in which would say, would probably say, John, you're being arrogant here. You heard him. You think you know the truth. No, John says, I know the truth. I was there. In the midst of this culture of uncertainty, we need to be certain about the truth. 
Jesus had a real human body. He had a real humanity. And this, by the way, has tremendous implications for Christianity, for Christian truth, because tr- Christian truth is a beautiful garment that is weaved together. If you pull out a major strand in that garment, it will begin to unfold. I don't know if you've ever done that. You know, you have a shirt or something. There's like a little string hanging out, and you, you say, what's this doing here? Let me yank this off, and all of a sudden, whoa, now I've got a big hole in my sweater. If you pull out the humanity of Christ, other important doctrines begin to unfold as well. Think about it. Who is our, who is our representative in the Garden of Eden? Adam, a real human. Who is the representative of the new creation and the new covenant? Jesus. If Jesus isn't really human, can he really be our representative? He can't. This is why John says later on in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have what? An advocate. We have a representative. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins. The humanity of Christ is necessary for the substitution of Christ to have a representative before God. If you begin to pull out the humanity of Christ, then you pull out who Jesus is and you pull out the cross and the resurrection. So friends, be certain about the humanity of Jesus. Later on, John says in 1 John 4, 14, He says, we have seen and testify. That language again, seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John's saying, I saw, I heard, I touched. Believe it. Be certain about it. But he's not only a historical witness of the humanity of Jesus, He's also a historical witness to the deity of Jesus, the godness of Jesus. Notice how he describes Jesus at the end of verse 1. He says, concerning the word of life. The word of life. Uh, This is familiar to us if you're familiar with the Gospel of John because, as I mentioned earlier, John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And so John, the apostle here, again uses this language here and calls Jesus the Word of life. And I take that to mean the Word which gives life. But let's stop and think about Word for a second. What does it mean? Why would John call Jesus the Word? Well, what is a Word? A Word is a communication. A Word is an expression. And what John is saying is that Jesus is the expression of the Father. He's the perfect revelation of the Father. He says this at the culmination of the prologue of the Gospel of John, John 1.18, when he says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is in the bosom of the Father, has what? Made Him known, has exegeted Him, has declared Him. That Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father. Or in the language of Paul, Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. Or the author of Hebrews, and He is the exact representation of His glory. Uh, I'm sorry, He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. This is part of Jesus' role as prophet. He reveals God to us. You want to know what God looks like? You look at Jesus. And so it's no wonder that Jesus would say to Philip, Philip, you've been with me so long. Don't you know, Philip, if you've what? Seen me, you've seen the Father. 
Not that Jesus is the same person with the Father, that there's, there's one person within God. No, there's three persons. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father to us. But he is the Word, the Word of life, namely the Word that gives life, the Word that gives eternal life. And then notice what he calls him in verse 2. In the life was manifested, we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. But then notice this, this explanation of the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So he says this life was manifested, verse 2. He calls it eternal life that they've seen, testify, and proclaim. And then he calls, he says the eternal life which was with the Father and again was manifested to us. I think the, it's, it's actually, it should be literally the eternal, the life, should be capitalized. Now that would be an interpretive decision to make there. In, in Greek, it's very rare that the, the, the first letters of words are capitalized. But similar to word of life, I think the eternal life should be capitalized. And let me tell you why. Turn to the end of 1 John, in chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. And then notice this sentence. This, who's the this refer back to? Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourself from idols. He calls Jesus the true God and eternal life. And so back in the beginning of the letter when he's referring to the eternal life which was with the Father and has now been manifested to us, he's calling Jesus eternal life, the eternal life. He's calling him the word of life and he's calling him the eternal life. And notice this phrase, which was with the Father and has been manifested to us. That's a deep. We're, we're swimming in the deep end of the theological pool at this point. He was with the Father. John's referring to eternity past. With the Father, but in history, in space, in time, became man, took upon humanity so that I touched him, so that I heard him, so that I saw him, but, but he has a nature that went beyond my physical touch that was with the Father, the eternal life who is the true God. Wow. John is telling us here that while he had a real human nature, a real physical body, that I could hear and see and touch. He also had a nature that went beyond <clears throat> my seeing and touching <clears throat> that was actually with the Father in eternity past. We get a window into this when Jesus prays in John 17. Remember in John 17 and verse 5, He's talking to the Father. He says, Father, Restore unto me the glory that I had with you before the world ever began. Whoa, that's deep. Jesus is talking about his eternal relationship with the Father before creation ever took place. Friends, this should cause us to hold our hands over the, our mouth, jaw dropped. Say, who is this Jesus? John's answer is, he's the God-man. 
It was the Southern Baptist preacher, Truett, who spoke of Jesus as the God hyphen man. And he said, what an amazing hyphen that is. It causes us to sit and wonder, how does that happen? How does the eternal, immutable, unchanging, infinite God wed himself to a human body? I haven't the slightest idea. But I know it's true. We have eyewitness testimony that it's true. John was there in that boat when Jesus was both sleeping and then the next second got up and commanded the creation. He was there to see Jesus get hungry, but he was also there to see him create enough food to feed a small army. He was there to see Jesus in the agonies of his real humanity suffering on the cross, being publicly executed. And he was also there to see him in the glory of his transfiguration and in the glory of his resurrection. He saw both the lamb in his humility and his sacrifice and the lion of Jesus. And you know what? He didn't keep silent about it. He tells us. Notice what he says here. He says in verse 2, And the life was manifested, and we have seen, and we testify. We testify. This is a, a kind of legal term, right? You know, we speak of... Are you going to testify in court? John saying, I testify as a witness. I saw. I heard. <clears throat> I touched. I was there. I testify to you. This is the truth. John Stott calls this the authority of experience. But he doesn't stop there. He says, not only have I seen and testify, I proclaim to you and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And then he says in verse 3, we have seen and heard and we proclaim to you also. Proclamation, not only testify, but proclamation. He's like a herald saying, this is the truth. Jesus had real humanity and real deity wrapped up in one person. This is who he was. You must believe it. And it's a proclamation that has been commissioned by Jesus himself. Remember I said the importance of these, these apostles being witnesses? But they were also commissioned with the message. Jesus told them, you guys are my public relations group. You need to go with this message and tell others, tell others who I am. Tell others what I came to do. And beautifully, they not only audibly lifted up their voices and declared Jesus. Notice in verse 4, John says, these things we write. Sweet Jesus, he wrote it down. Because John died and his remains are buried somewhere in the Middle East. And they didn't record MP3s of him preaching. But he did write it down and the apostles wrote down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God so that you have it in your lap and on a big screen above my head. You have the testimony as to who Jesus really was and is today. And this is hugely important. John says he was with the Father, this eternal life, this God, this Word who was with the Father was manifested to us 
He is God, a very God, and He demands our worship and adoration, our full-hearted devotion. That's why, did you ever wonder why Jesus could say some of the shocking things that He says? No mere man can say some of those things. I mentioned one of them earlier when I was talking about Bernard's hymn where he re- refers to us as friends of Jesus. Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this that a man lay down his life for his friends and you are my friends if what? You obey me. You do what I tell you. I mean, what friend says that? I'll be your friend if you just do what I tell you to do. Only the God man says that kind of stuff. Or Jesus says on another occasion, Anyone who loves father or mother more than me, scram, you're not worthy of me. What? (laughs) Who says that? If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, you need to be willing to take the death march to be one of my followers. Who could make such demands and claims? I mean, only one who's God in the flesh. Who can make such demands and claims upon our lives of absolute, exclusive, and full devotion. And that's why John, at the end of the letter, he says what seems somewhat cryptically, but it makes sense, hopefully a little bit more sense now, my little children... Stand clear of idols. Be on guard against idols. What he's saying there is any belief about Jesus that is sub what I'm telling you, that is different than what I'm telling you, is idolatry. It's another Jesus which is to be another God. This is why it's so important. (laughs) Because to have the wrong Jesus is to commit idolatry. To have the wrong Jesus is to miss out on eternal life. And so we can have certainty. We have eyewitness testimony that has been inscripturated for us. We can have confidence. In a world of fuzziness that says, well, you know, Jesus, you know, he seemed like a swell guy. No. Or as the Muslims say, he was, he was Messiah, he was a prophet, but he wasn't the son of God, he wasn't the God man. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses, well, he was a lesser kind of God, a created God. Or the Mormons, he was once like us, but he ascended to deity Or the liberal Protestants, he was a good moral teacher. A guy you should feel warm and fuzzy about. But he's not the God-man. No, friends, Jesus is the God-man. You can be certain about that. You must be certain about that. You must believe that reality. He is God, he is man. And John, in a very real sense takes us back to his own experience, his own literal, physical experience with Jesus. Now, none of us in this room have had that kind of experience, but it's worth asking the question, have you had an experience with Jesus? Not the same kind that John had where you could lay on his chest, but as you have seen him revealed to us in the Scriptures Have you seen him in his agonies? As Bernard wrote so many years ago, O sacred head, now wounded. Look at his head with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does that visage language languish which once was bright as morn? Have you seen who Jesus is? And have you responded with a heart of faith, believing, trusting in who he is? If you haven't, 
Look at him this morning and believe. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this eyewitness testimony that we have from your servant, John. Give us a heart of faith to believe and to keep believing, to be certain as to who Jesus is and to respond appropriately. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close by singing Shout to the Lord. I've done some shouting. Now we can all do some shouting. If you'd like to stand, we're going to, as Matt said, close with Shout to the Lord. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. At the sound of your name, I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the sea will roar. At the sound of your name, I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the sea will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you.
stand Nothing compares to the promise I have in you Amen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful message uh, to think that men on earth got to see and touch the Lord, uh, to hear his voice, to know what his voice sounds like. And, and yet now today we get to look into the beauty of scripture and we get to see him plainly there for us as well. And so I just want to encourage all of you to trust in him. He is the head of of all authority. He is the King of Kings. He's the, the Lord of all, the ruler of all, and we should go and proclaim him to others. Amen. May the grace of our Lord be with you all. Amen.